Hey everybody and welcome to another Darkest Dungeon mod overview. My name is Element5 and tonight we get to take a look at Marvin Seo's The Sisters. Now as I mentioned briefly in the Lamia video, I've had the pleasure of getting to know Marvin over the last year. Uh, he's been a member of my community and has done uh, some of the emote artwork for my channel, but also he's just been watching me uh, play and live stream his modded classes over the course of the last year, and he put me up to something called the Seo Special Challenge, which was a live stream event to play uh, only his modded classes, a group of his four modded classes, the Seo Special, through the Crimson Court to kill each individual boss in a single run. And the success of each boss kill came with a an exclusive leak, a window into the work Marvin was doing developing his new and upcoming standalone dungeon mod, tentatively called the Sunken City, which features a huge array of bosses and enemies and factions. Now at the conclusion of the Seo Special Challenge, things went a little bit quiet with Marvin because we were soon to find out that he, as well as Claire DeLune, another prominent member of the DD community, were assisting Red Hook in the development and production of their newest DLC, The Color of Madness. Knowing that Marvin's involvement in the development of the new DLC meant the postponing of a lot of work and development he was going to do on his own standalone dungeon, you can imagine then my excitement at uh, him revealing to me that he was working on a new modded class, a fifth modded class, something that was going to stand out among the other four that he had already made. And given his previous work on the Seo Special classes, it was clear to me that this was going to have to be a class that really challenged Marvin and stood out as something unique in the DD sphere, something challenging, fairly complex. And now that the sisters have been out for the last couple weeks, I think it is safe to say at this point that we are indeed seeing Marvin's most complex and complicated class, and also one of his most beautiful. In addition, I think this might be the first uh, modded class or Darkest Dungeon class in general that I've been able to play that really rewards and even incentivizes a frequent transformation from state A to state B, which is, uh, in general, transformation classes, as I know from Muscarine and other prominent modders in the DD community, are very, very laborious to pull off and uh, difficult to do right. So to see Marvin take on the task of doing a transformation class that rewards and incentivizes frequent transformation is something pretty amazing to behold. And based on their description, uh, the sisters are two souls bound within one body constantly fighting each other for control over their vessel. Known as the Scholar and the Warrior, the former is able to maintain control outside of combat, but when the heat of battle commences, the latter can find opportunities to seize control. Each sister specializes in different techniques for combat. The Scholar uses forbidden knowledge she stole from her order's temple, manipulating the life essence of the world to aid herself and allies while hindering the enemy. The warrior, in contrast, prefers the visceral feel of melee combat, passing from foe to foe in a bloody display of finesse and cruelty. However, if the vessel is disrupted significantly, the sisters will begin to defy one another, seizing control from each other at unexpected times and detaching themselves from the body. Such animosity leaves the sisters' body vulnerable and allows the enemy an opportune time to end them for good. Now, as with the rest of Marvin's classes, we get to feast our eyes on a really beautiful custom comic strip that helps to explain their backstory somewhat. And, uh, and, and this one is no exception. In this case, Marvin went over the top and did a double comic strip to really represent the duality of this class. If we just focus here on the left column with the Scholar Sister, we can see her outside a room uh, which features the warrior sister drinking with a bunch of other individuals. The scholar quickly gets herself into a room, closes the door behind her, pulls out her scrolls, reads them, enacting some sort of a spell or curse, and then pasting the scrolls uh, up on the wall and the doorway, then grabbing a knife and heading over to the room where her sister the warrior is. Now if we just focus on the right column with the warrior sister for a second, we can see, we can see the warrior sister drinking and toasting a group of other warriors, the other warriors taking in the drinks and then slowly but surely uh, succumbing to whatever was served to them, passing out. The warrior sister then looming over one of them passed out, pulling out her blade to kill them, and then being interrupted as the scholar sister comes into the room ready to fight. So as is the nature with a lot of these comics, uh, they tend to be pretty obscure uh, since a lot of the details are revealed through in-game barks and journal pages, and in this case, the sisters have their own unique journal pages, which you can loot if you're using the Seraph. 
But what Marvin revealed to me is that the room that we see the sister in here is actually full of men handpicked for their beauty for the warrior. The warrior is a sadist and serial killer. So after all the warriors fall asleep, she gave in to her impulses and was about to kill one of the soldiers until she was interrupted by the scholar. The actual events of what happened are unknown, but both sisters believe they killed the other. The warrior remembers killing the scholar when she attacked first, which led to the scholar possessing her. The scholar believes she killed the warrior in her drunken state, but she had purpose to place a curse on her which would kill the warrior's sister, uh, which she now believes is the cause of her returning from the dead to haunt her. In any case, because they are identical twins, they're not sure exactly who the body belongs to, and both believe that they killed the other. Marvin adds that what is confirmed is that one of the sisters, as well as the sleeping soldiers, were brutally murdered. The other sister disappeared. So all of this information then sets us a beautiful preface to better understand the intention behind the mechanics of this class. Now we're only two weeks into the release of the sisters, but I think it is po it's fair to say that this might be the most versatile and most powerful of Marvin Sayo's modded classes. The sisters come with an incredible amount of utility and output. Uh, packed within her kit is marking, armor piercing, repost, uh, heal over time, stress healing, tons of movement, which basically make her shuffle immune. She works with bleed groups. She works well with mark groups. She works well with blight groups. She's very useful against high prot enemies. She can stealth, she can self heal, okay? However, all of this versatility, this power and utility comes at a very hefty cost of serious stress management. And the really important thing to point out about how she works before we go into how every one of these abilities breaks down is to take a look at this right down here. Every single one of her abilities she uses, with the exception of her transformation, adds this at the bottom, self stress plus four. Okay, at level two, stress plus four self. So every ability she's using stresses herself out. However, when you use possession, which changes her from the scholar to the warrior and vice versa, changes her from state eight to be in back, this is actually a self stress heal, but it comes at the cost of stressing out the rest of your companions by a little bit. Again, working on that theme that if you're grouped with something that is a little bit weird, it's a little bit abominable, and it's transforming, and it's kind of creepy, whatever it's doing that's creepy is going to be stressing out the group. Makes total sense. So the key then to understanding how to optimally play the sisters is this mess down here, which can look a little bit intimidating, uh, but it basically reduces to this concept. The longer you stay as one sister, the more stress you're going to take from her abilities, and the less stress you're going to take from the other sisters. So if I'm in state A, and I use one of the abilities of the Scholar, I'm gonna get a hit of plus 50% stress received, but at the same time, minus 50% stress received for warrior skills. So again, you just have to visualize this as a scale. It is a fulcrum, a balancing act. The longer you stay as one sister, the more stress her abilities are going to do uh, every time you use them, and the less stress the other sister's going to take. So then you use a couple of her abilities, you possess, and you swap sisters, and now you have a little bit of freedom to use a couple of her abilities before the stress starts to ramp really heavy on that sister. And this is the important thing to note about the sisters is they cannot virtue. They only have one affliction, which is called discordant. And hitting affliction and becoming discordant comes with a reduction of death blow resist, stun resist, move resist, dodge, and speed, as well as a high chance of causing the sisters to inflict stress onto other heroes, move out of position, perform random actions, deny movement, block retreat, uh, prevent sisters camping skills, etc. It is a mess. So now that we understand uh, a little bit of how stress ramping and transformation works with the sisters, let's focus first on the kit for the scholar, these first three abilities here. And the first ability is Weed Out. Weed Out can be used in any position and it can target any enemy in any position. Uh, it is a ranged ability with a decent accuracy base. It is packed with utility. It bypasses stealth, it de-stealths a target, it marks a target, it has a 110% chance at level two to land a blight for four over four, which is a considerable blight hit. It also gains plus 17 accuracy versus bleeding, and again, comes at the cost of stressing self plus four. 
And because you always start in combat as the Scholar's sister, I find Weed Out to be one of her best openers. So then next is Blossom. Blossom uh, can only be used in rank 2 or 3. This is one of the only times where her abilities are really rank dependent. And uh, it is a heal over time that she can use on any member of the party and herself of 3 points of health for the next 3 rounds, as well as a stress heal minus 9, but at the cost of de-stealthing herself and, again, stressing herself plus 4. So let's just take a moment to appreciate the value of this ability. You have a heal 3 over 3, which if we compare that to the level 3 reclaim of a flagellant, is, is actually better than that at level 2. So this is a really significant heal over time. And it comes with a stress heal of 9, which is really significant. If we compare at level 2, if we compare that to the level 3 stress heal of Inspiring Tune on the Jester, which is a stress heal minus 10, uh, this is a very, very significant stress heal. Uh, but again, comes at the cost of de-stealthing herself and the self-stress plus 4. So then the last ability in the Scholar's Kit is Bramble. Bramble can be used in any position, and it is essentially her Repost. It activates Repost for three rounds with minus 75% damage if in mode Scholar, gain 32% prot and a 25% bleed chance with armor piercing. So you activate Bramble in any position and you get Repost, plus 32% prot buff, 25% bleed chance, and armor piercing while reposting, again at the cost of self-stress plus 4. Just note here that it says minus 75% damage if in mode Scholar. What that means is, because this repost lasts for 3 rounds, you can actually transform into the warrior and still retain repost, and then it is not penalized for minus 75% damage. Interestingly to note here also, uh, the warrior is always the one doing the repost. So even if you stay in mode Scholar and you have Repost active, actually the Warrior Spirit will do the repost damage, and then if you transform into the Warrior, the Warrior will actually do the repost damage. Impressive. So the first ability then in the Warrior's Kit is Trespass. Trespass can be used in any position and it will hit any enemy in any position. It moves her forward too. It has decent accuracy and a crit modifier of plus 6%. It has full armor piercing. And if you're new to Darkest Dungeon, what that means is a complete prot negation, okay? It will bypass guard, so you can target, you know, any sort of weak backline uh, stress healer or, or damage dealer that is guarded by, say, a Pelagic Guardian, for example. And interestingly, it will always crit versus marked, again at the cost of self-stress plus four. I think this might be her strongest ability, and as Marvin points out, it might just be because it feels so good to use. I mean, it moves you forward to the front line, it has complete armor piercing, it bypasses guard, and it always crits versus a marked target. Important to note, too, that the always crit versus marked uh, considerable in terms of a source of stress heal for the rest of the group. Annihilated. Next in the Warrior's Kit, then, is Shroud. Shroud is only usable in position 1, 2, or 3, and it is essentially the Warrior's defensive ability. It will, move the, it will move the sisters all the way back to rank 4. It will buff self for a heal 2 over 3. It will clear marks on the sisters. And then it will stealth the sisters for 3 rounds with the included buff plus 25% blight chance while stealthed. So the way that I think about utilizing Shroud is if for any reason you're just taking too much damage in the front line as the warrior and you just need to get back and stealth yourself, get get a heal rolling, etc. Or maybe you're in scholar mode and you got for some reason shuffled to the front line and you're very vulnerable. Well now you can switch to warrior, you can go to shroud, go all the way to the back line, hide, 
stealth self and get a heal over time. So the last ability then in the Warrior's Kit is Crimson Dance. Crimson Dance is only usable in rank 4 or 2, and it will target both enemies in position 1 and 3. It moves you forward 1, and this is a key thing to understand here because if you're in position 4 or 2 and you use Crimson Dance, you are now in position 3 or 1, in which case you can't use it again. It comes with an accuracy base 100, a minus 25% damage modifier, and a plus 2% crit modifier. Again, it has armor piercing and complete prot negation, a 110% chance at level 2 to land a 3 over 3 bleed, which is a significant bleed at this level. It will debuff the enemies for shuffle, and a 52% damage modifier versus blighted enemies, with, again, the cost of self-stress plus 4. Uh, Crimson Dance is a really beautiful ability. It's just... It's just beautifully designed in my mind. The fact that you might say, for example, use Shroud to get yourself into position 4, and now that you're in position 4, you can Crimson Dance to move forward, hitting both position 1 and 3. As the Fiend falls, a faint hope blossoms. So if you're really looking for just a little bit of hand-holding on how to use her kit effectively, one thing you can just practice is to open up with Weed Out. Because you def you always start as the Scholar in combat, so you open up with Weed Out, you mark a target, you make that target vulnerable by bypassing stealth, you maybe land a Blight on it. All of that is really significant by itself. Uh, but because you're starting and using an ability in Scholar, you are now then starting to ramp the stress in Scholar, but debuff the stress taken in Warrior. So the next turn, you can uh, use Possession, transform to Warrior, and for basically no stress ramp, go right into Trespass and get a guaranteed crit on the target you just marked, or go right into Crimson Dance and have plus 52% damage versus Blighted. So now suddenly the stress ramp is balanced because you've used one Scholar ability and now one Warrior ability, so you can effectively then now use another warrior ability, say Shroud for example, get yourself back to the back line, uh, and then tr trespass next turn and go into, uh, say, Weed Out again, and now you've buffed yourself with 25% Blight chance, and then hit with a Blight with Weed Out. Now in terms of her camping utility, she has a Prevent Nighttime Ambush, but uh, the rest of her kit is, is really unique and really pertains to the way her mechanics work. So uh, if we look at rigorous studies, a time cost 2, self only, 30% stress healing if done in Scholar for the next 4 battles, plus 30% Blight chance if mode Scholar, but at the cost of 15 stress. So you take a 15 stress hit here for this, but you're going to get a lot more stress healing output and a blight chance if you're in the scholar mode. So if you start in scholar, you always start in scholar mode, and if you're doing a lot of opening with weed out, or you're trying to stress manage with blossom, uh, this might be an ability to go for. Of course, just keep in mind, the longer you stay in one form, the worse that stress ramp gets. So next I think is her most fascinating camping ability, which is Blackened Psyche. Uh, this is a time cost three, self only minus 45% stress received for the next four battles, but at the hefty cost of all companions get 15% stress received for the next four battles. So my interpretation of this camping ability then is, is this. If you are, uh, you, st you always start combat defaultly in mode Scholar. So if you're just using a ton of utility with the Scholar and you're not transforming sisters very often, so you're doing a lot of blight and marking, uh, you're doing a little bit of stress healing or, and, and healing, or you're, you're using repost very frequently, and you're just never transforming to the warrior, this is a means then to help just reduce the, the stress damage you're taking uh, because, because you're not transforming very often, you're not hitting the rest of the party with stress hits. So effectively then this means that Black and Psyche is less effective if you want to stay warrior longer because, because again, as I said, you start as the scholar in combat, which means if you want to go warrior, you're going to at least hitting possession once then you're hitting the rest of your companions with that stress hit, and they're taking plus 15 stress received. However, you're staying Scholar for the most part through your through combat, uh, then you never have to see that group stress hit. 
Next is Spectral Watchguard. Uh, time cost three. This is her prevent nighttime ambush utility. Uh, all companions, if not religious, plus five stress. If religious, plus ten. So this is actually a pretty affordable prevent nighttime ambush. Uh, time cost three is is really reasonable for prevent nighttime ambush, but it comes at the cost of stressing out the rest of your group. And because she seems to be sort of an evil, you know, an evil character, uh, two evil sisters for the most part involved in sadism and death and killing. Uh, if not religious, you're going to hit less stress, and if religious, you're going to be bothered. You're going to be bothered by the Spectral Watchguard more. But finally, then, we have Warrior Heart. Time cost 2, self only, plus 15% damage of in-mode Warrior, plus 15% bleed chance of in-Warrior, and a 15 stress hit. So this is pretty straightforward. If you're using a ton of the Warrior's kit, then you're going to get a plus 15% damage output, as well as plus 15% bleed chance when you use Crimson Dance. So I had a lot of conversation with Marvin about the most optimal way to think about trinketing the sisters, and I think the general consensus is not to try not to use uh, trinkets which come with the plus stress received uh, costs. And this is just obvious because everything she's doing has that plus stress for hit on it. So the first time I played her, I really made this mistake, and it was clear that ramping her up to affliction and not really understanding that I wanted to swap possession with frequency just was really punishing to use anything with plus stress on it. Therefore, it's probably considerable to use things that that will boost her accuracy and crit like a focus ring, even though this was nerfed recently, or something like a recovery charm, which again will boost the healing received when she uses shroud with her heal over time, or if she uses blossom on herself. Uh, neither of these, of course, coming with any stress penalty, so for the most part clean, and uh, buffing her, just buffing her overall efficacy. Then it might also be considerable not to use things that have plus stress received on the companions in your party as well. Because again, uh, all of her abilities stress herself, but every time you use possession, you're actually stressing out the companions and de-stressing self. As always, I'll include the link to download the sisters from Steam in the information below the video, as well as a link to Marvin's other mods, which include the uh, instantaneous town event if you would like to play the sisters immediately, as well as their Crimson Court Trinkets and Color of Madness DLC Trinkets. I sincerely hope you've enjoyed this brief overview of Marvin Sayo's sisters. Special thanks to Marvin for all his info and help and for being just an all-around spectacular guy. If you have any questions about how to play the sisters, please feel free to ask me in the comments section below. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.